Good morning, everybody. I'm Nicola Barrett, Chief Corporate Learning Officer at Emory Executive Education at Goysweather Business School. And thank you for joining us this morning for Business Over Breakfast. Before I say anything else, I do want to give a big shout out to Tammy, Heather, Kavita, Pam, uh, and Jen, who made sure that these Business Over Breakfast webinars uh, were hosted over the summer um, when I was unable to join. So thank you all. You're just a fabulous um, set of folks and a wonderful team to have. As leaders, we're tasked with delivering great business results year after year. And we do this through the work of our teams. Yet how much energy do we spend focused on how well the team is collaborating versus where we are with our results. Despite how important collaboration is for the success of projects and initiatives, most organizations and teams themselves often don't spend time getting better at collaboration. And we think that's a missed opportunities for leaders, for team members and organizations. This morning, I'm excited to welcome back Scott Sanchez, a practitioner faculty for Goizueta Business School, and Robert Barris, Brightwell's Chief Innovation Officer, to discuss collaborative leadership, a simple methodology designed to transform how teams work by balancing results with process and relationships between people. Scott is a human-driven product innovation leader with expertise in innovation, product management and design, and a history of turning deep human insights into simple yet impactful projects and experiences that delight customers. He and his family just came back from the Paris Olympics and I'm very, very envious of that. Robert brings over 20 years of experience in business strategy, marketing, product development, user experience and corporate innovation. He has a background in improv comedy that's proven beneficial in helping clients shift their thinking and pivot gracefully. He's also launched a newsletter, which I love the title of, called Fail Spectacularly, which is helping him prototype a book he's writing about innovation. As innovation leaders, they've had to focus on helping teams collaborate as much as they've had to focus on helping them innovate. And they want to bring those learnings from innovation teams to us today. In addition to uh, Scott's work with our graduate students and corporate clients, uh, he brings his expertise to two of our short courses, open enrollment short courses, Disrupting Your Business Strategy, as well as Unlocking Growth with Design Thinking and AI. And both are taking place in fall, and we'd love to have you check those out and join us, um, join us uh, in fall. And we'll post information about that in the calendar. So Scott and Robert are going to spend about 30, 35 minutes um, presenting their ideas, exploring how we might place the user at the center of our innovation work. Uh, and this will be followed by some Q&A. So please put your questions in the Q&A or the chat um, and we'll get to as many of them as possible. And with that, see the numbers have come up. They've doubled since I did my spiel. I told you, it was like, everyone waits till I get, get done. All right, have a wonderful uh, have a wonderful morning. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say, Scott and Robert. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Maybe, Nicola, we could have you keep talking and the numbers keep going up. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> no, hello, everybody. We're thrilled. Robert and I are thrilled uh, to talk to you today about collaborative leadership. Um, Nicola already did a great job uh, introducing us. Uh, we've both led product and innovation elements uh, at various companies, and we've worked at a number of companies. And you know, these are just a smattering of some of the ones we've worked at: some big, some small, some well-known, some not, some B 2 C, some B 2 B, and across the board. And this is really where we've done uh, this type of work to figure out how important and how we can help teams collaborate. Um, and we're here to share some of those lessons learned and some of the tools that we hope you try. And maybe by the end. We hope you're energized to try some of these with your teams in the coming days and weeks. We'll sort of give you a framework overall and talk about and give a story about collaborative leadership and whatnot. But what we really care about is that people try some of these tools. So we're going to give you some how to's in terms of how to bring some of these elements to your teams and to your leaderships. And by the way, if you actually do try some of these things, which we'd appreciate, let us know. Let us know how it goes, what worked, what didn't work, et cetera. This has been a journey for us as we figured out what works and what doesn't. Uh, and we're happy to share with you that journey now. 
All right. So in order to make this happen, we're going to use Zoom. As Nicholas said, we're going to use Zoom chat. Uh, uh, and so please, along the way, please put questions or comments in there. We might mention them during the presentation. We might not. But then we'll make sure to get to questions at the end. And so either use Zoom chat or use Zoom Q&A. Either of those are going to work. We're going to be monitoring both of those things. And of course, you can see the presentation. But we're also going to be using a tool called Mentimeter. And Mentimeter is this real-time answering of questions where we're actually going to ask you to answer some of the questions that we pose, and we'll use that as part of our conversation as well. So with that, let's get into that. The way you use Menti is on your smartphone or on your computer, go to menti.com in any browser and enter the code you see on the screen, or use your smartphone to take a picture of the QR code, and it should launch you right into uh, that. And so we'll use this as we go through, as we ask you a series of questions, because we're excited to share with you what we've learned, but we're also excited to hear from you about what matters to you. So let's just get to the first Minty question. Our question is this, how good is your team at collaboration? Right, so go ahead and by the way, you can see at the top, if you miss the code, join at Minty.com, you can see the code at the top and we already see some numbers coming in, great. How good is your team? Is it very good? We use best practices. Is it okay? You know, we work pretty well together and usually accomplish things. Is it bumpy? So we're sort of somewhat, or quite frankly, we, we really need to throw out everything and start over because we're just not at all good at this. So great, as these numbers are coming in, we're starting to see things. Clearly a lot of people, a lot of teams are okay. What I think that means for us is there's goodness there and we wanna preserve the goodness, but there's opportunities there as well. And that's what we'll focus on. And of course about 20, 22% of us are in the somewhat not at all, that's great. Uh, if you're in the 10%, very good, phenomenal. Maybe you should be teaching this. Uh, so we look forward to your participation along the way. All right, so that's sort of where we are and just as sort of giving us an idea of how good we are at collaboration. Let's go to the next question. Because I think I can, there you go. Which is, what's the hardest part of building a high-performing team? Is it about creating a diverse team that's hard? Oops, sorry, let me go back. Creating a diverse team that's hard? Is it providing the team great space and great tools? Is it driving accountability uh, across the team? Is it moving smart and moving fast? Aligning the team is another area we see. Or is it about reflecting and repairing as things go wrong, whether small things or big things? Great, so we're starting to see some come in. We appreciate that as well. Uh, it seems like shared accountability and aligning teams start to pop more, great. We'll wait, we'll wait a few more uh, a few more seconds just to get more in. So we appreciate that. Um, definitely some around how do you create a diverse team? We'll talk a little bit about that today. Providing great space and tools in this world of remote and hybrid and in office and not in the office, we see that uh, as an opportunity. We'll talk a little bit about that today, not much. But I gotta say, Robert, at least initially, what, you know, where we're gonna spend most of our time today is in shared accountability, moving smart to go fast and aligning team. And at least initially, that seems like a good fit for our audience, yeah? Yeah, it's an interesting uh, interesting response. It, it coincides well with what we've planned for today. So this is great. Awesome. Okay, so there you go. So that gives us an idea of sort of where we are. So thank you for that. We'll come back to some Minty questions in a little bit, but let's get into this. So Robert and I have learned that innovation is a journey, and we've spent a lot of our time on the innovation side of things. Now, don't get scared of that word. We use that word very broadly. It means lots of things. All it really means is solving problems for customers or for people, right? It's not this, oh my gosh, we're going to use the, the latest Bitcoin blockchain AI thing to drive change, but it's a journey. It steps forward and it steps back. And the number one thing we have learned is that great innovation is awesome, but if you don't pair that with great collaboration, you're not gonna get where you need to get to. So we've had to focus our leadership and our coaching as much if not more on helping teams collaborate as helping them follow a good innovation process. And I think that's the really thing that's really interesting. And even though our learnings have been on the innovation side of things, we fundamentally believe this applies much broader than innovation because business is a journey and business has teams as well. And our teams go on a journey as they go through this, whether it's a new product, a project, a program, a launch, an initiative, whatever it is, these teams go on a journey. 
Now you're probably familiar with a classic model of a journey of a team from Foreman to Storman to Norman to performing to a journey. I love that. I love that phrase. And that's been sort of our model for a number of years. And it's great. It's a really strong model. However, we actually find it understates the impact on people. So let's get into that. Robert? Yeah, so the layers are a bit deeper. You know, Scott alluded to this. We think of it not just in innovation, but within business, the ambiguity of subject material can be taxing on people. Obviously, bringing new products to market has a little bit more taxing than perhaps an existing product, existing market, but it still can weigh on people as they go through the journey of doing the work. Relationships. We all know that relationship dynamics amongst teams and amongst leadership with teams uh, can be challenging, right? And so that's just another layer that people have to go through. The doing of the work, that in some ways is sort of the easy part. Uh, pressure of results. You know, how do you live up to the results that the business needs and perhaps even what your team wants to achieve? And then finally, that daily emotional response. I mean, every day this stuff weighs in on you. And so when Scott and I as innovators think about how people think, feel, and do, you start to see that it's just a bit more complicated than simply forming, storming, norming, and, and making the charge forward. Um, so the problem isn't just limited to this. Uh, you know, stats and studies show it's pretty wide in terms of the challenges in today's collaborative environment. The vast majority of employees and executives cite collaboration for workplace failures. A heartbreaking, and I mean this sincerely, a heartbreak, almost, almost half of employees considered leaving jobs due to poor collaboration. That's awful. And then what probably isn't shocking to most of us is that billions of hours are wasted inside of meetings. Uh, I'm sure we'll all have at least one or five this week. Uh, and then obviously there's, there's also some studies around, you know, hey, just ineffective collaboration is wasting billions of hours of time. Um, so it's, it's wide, it's massive and it's measured. If you go a step further, it's interesting that the large majority of folks, both as executives and knowledge workers, agree there's a problem. They see it slightly different, but the problem is shared. Executives are essentially saying they believe that outcomes could be delivered in half the time if collaboration was better. On the flip side, knowledge workers, of course, say, listen, in order to innovate, uh, organizations really need to improve how they collaborate and they communicate. Um, so it's interesting, obviously, today, even in our poll, just to see that so many of you guys feel like you're collaborating well. That's incredible. Um, you know, the vast majority, it sounds like the vast majority are having challenges with this. And so when Scott and I think a lot about like, well, how do leaders spend their time? Um, a lot of times you spend your time receiving information from teams. You're on sort of your, your heels waiting for a share out, learning what they've done, um, assessing performance you're not doing what we think you should be doing, right? Like getting in the weeds with a team, coaching them, facilitating, helping them think through the challenges that they have, not just doing the work, but how to collaborate and, and to create a better form of the team that they're trying to accomplish all their business goals through. And so Scott and I have been obsessed over the last several weeks in particular about like, well, how do you, how do you redesign this? How do you redesign this process to be more human? Scott, talk a little bit more about the how. Yeah, absolutely. And this, you know, there are a lot of different ways to innovate. You can be technology driven, you can be process driven, business model. The way Robert and I have been most successful is by being human driven or human centered. So that's what we've tried to apply because at the end of the day, a team is made up of people. So what we'd ask you to think about is what we think we need to do is create what we're calling collaborative leadership. Collabor collaborative leadership is the practice of creating the conditions for the team members to create flow. We've all been in flow. We know what flow looks like. It, you know, the sports analogy is probably one of the better ones where a team is in flow. By the way, if you saw Steph Curry at the end of the gold medal game, the four three-pointers he hit, man, he couldn't miss. He was in flow. You could argue he needed to involve his teammates more, but regardless, gold medal, great. That was flow. He just hit it. And we want to create the conditions for teams to do that. And the thing I would ask you to think about the most is when you think about a team, instead of thinking about what the outcome is going to be first, think about how can you make the process of engagement and the interaction between team members easy? That's the thing that matters. How do we create the conditions so that people can contribute easily and interact easily and collaborate easily? That doesn't mean giving in to everything they say or just saying yes, but it means if we can have a lens of how we can help people lean in and collaborate easily, then we can actually get to the outcomes that we want. So Robert, why don't you bring us to, bring it to life for us? Yeah, 
So I want to tell a brief story. Um, so at the top uh, in my introduction, it was mentioned, uh, I work at Brightwell today. I'm the chief innovation officer. Prior to that, I worked at a company called 352. Uh, we were an innovation agency. We were helping big companies try to build startups and new ventures. Uh, so I wanted to tell a little story about a team that I worked with that uh, near and dear to my heart, that we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to collaborate better. So I want you guys to meet Jess. So Jess today is on my team here at Brightwell. She's an innovation research lead. Um, but previously at 352, she was actually my VP of Insights and Research. Um, when I first brought her on board about six, seven years ago, uh, she was coming from marketing. She was a brilliant marketer, had a great creative mind, uh, and was a great critical thinker. And so she, like so many other people I brought into innovation, came from really diverse backgrounds, uh, different skill sets, different experiences. And so I was trying to build a team to go and solve for highly ambiguous challenges. Uh, the team was made up of about five people, this particular team. Um, and they uh, they would often uh, break up into pairs. So two or two person pairs or three person pairs, um, all in support of doing work. And so we would have executive level people on this team and sort of mid-level people on the team. And the whole concept was try to create a learning environment, try to create an environment where people could uh, essentially learn by doing uh, and work with our clients across some highly ambiguous situations, facilitate research prototype uh, and build some pretty incredible results along the way. Um, the team was killing it. The team did an incredible job. Our clients were super happy, they were energized and they kept having incredible results. And yet I started to hear some challenges emerge on the team. And it was through conversations with Jess and others where I realized that the team was struggling. And so some of the elements I mentioned before about those layers of struggle, I'll try to unpack for just a couple of minutes here. The team, while working in highly ambiguous situations, um, they excelled. They did an incredible job. But the entire time, they were highly stressed. They were unsure if they were doing the right thing, unsure if they were coming to the right conclusions. And well, when you work in highly uh, ambiguous areas, that often could be the case. Um, they also had pressure of results. They felt like the clients uh, had high expectations. They felt like I had high expectations, despite having conversations about, hey, we're doing the best we can. We're doing the best we can to find and understand and make sense of what's uncertain. During this time period, relationships started plummeting. People started, let, uh, people started not trusting each other. They started having a lot of tension and uh, conflict. Uh, and ultimately, emotions started to overflow. And by the time I got involved and really started doing one-on-ones with the team and then brought them together for a workshop, we started having tears live. I, I, had, I had not had a team before really express this much emotion. And yet their project work was fantastic. The results were really good. And yet they felt this pressure. And so, you know, as we worked through it and understood that they needed more structure, they needed more uh, guidance, both for me as a leader, uh, and not just on the work, but on how to work together, uh, I started to realize we might not have a shared definition of how to work together. And so what was so interesting is to start the session, I did a, I did a very simple ask. I asked the team, how would you define collaboration? And I wanted to make sure I saw how each person viewed that world, and then what could I build in order to support them? And so what I'll never forget, and Scott, if you go to the next slide, we'll never forget is how different their definitions were. We saw people say it's a safe space to share ideas. We saw people say one plus one equals three. The exchange and melding ideas is for a common goal. It's about thinking different with a group. And the one that really hurt me uh, in such a good way, but it's impactful, it's a vulnerable act. Never thought of collaboration as a vulnerable act, to share ideas within a group. And so listen, you know, the team and I worked through some of the challenges, some of the relationships remained challenged even, even after this work, but I'll never forget the time and energy spent trying to coach and build capability around how to work together, not just how to do the work. And so for Scott and I, it became a little bit of a journey to say, hey, listen, how can we find a way to make this much more of a framework, much more of a method to allow others to sort of focus in on this? And so, you know, some of the stats that say collaboration can be effective are pretty wild. Um, you know, oh, and I may have skipped ahead. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. Uh, are pretty wild. Uh, and so, listen, there's some stats that say, you know, teams and companies that promote collaboration can be five times more likely to be high performing. Talks about how teams that use processes that help identify and plan for priorities are more than four times more effective and adaptable and productive. And the parts that I really, really like um, are on the human side right? 73% of employees perform better in collaborative environments. The environment that they're in helps them be a better person, a better team member. And then finally, great team collaboration can increase customer satisfaction and even higher profitability. And so we live in a state where it sounds like collaboration could be a bit better. 
Uh, and, and yet, we're, we're, we as leaders may not be focusing in on it uh, to try to drive a new how we're doing that. And so, Scott, let's talk a little bit more about the how, the framework for doing this. Absolutely. And so it, it's easy to say this um, uh, without a doubt. It's easy. You can look at your own days and weeks in terms of meetings and, and collaboration and whatnot. But how do you do it? So that's what we really want to spend a little bit of time on. And the first concept that I would just uh, ask you to think about is you need to balance results with process and relationships. And so it's this balancing act, right? The results. Of course, we need a team to achieve results. You know, that's the achievement of the goal, the, the increased revenue, the increased growth, growth, the completion of the task, the decreased cost, whatever that is. We know we need that uh, from a team to make that happen, whatever that is in your world. But we need to make sure to balance good results with also good relationships, because how people experience working together on this team, how they feel about their participation and their role, are they viewed positively? Are they on the outside? What does that look like? How they relate to the team matters a lot to them. It actually matters for the success of the collaboration. And then you need to balance results and relationships with process. How does the work get done? How is it mapped? What are we gonna do this week, next week? What should I do tomorrow? How do we monitor it? How do we assess how we're doing? And so one of the things we've learned is that balancing all three of these in a team is really critical for success. Another way to say this, you can almost think of the results as what we do and relationships and process as how we do it. You need great what and you need great how. And what we found is that most teams, most leaders especially, focus only on the results. Great, we need the results. But if you don't focus on relationships and process, and we've been successful actually focusing more on relationships and process to get the results, you need all three. For example, we've all been on teams, or no teams, where the results were great, but man, the people were burnt out, they were ready to leave, they were ready to quit their job, they weren't sure how work was getting done, and you can't replicate this. In an organization, we want teams to be able to work together and drive results multiple times, not just once along the way. So you can't replicate and your people get burnt out here. But quite frankly, the flip of this is also a problem. We've also seen teams where people are happy, they're thrilled, they enjoyed it, they have work best friends, and they followed a clear process, but they didn't achieve the results they wanted. That's not good either. We didn't get that outcome, we need that. What great collaboration looks like is all three being really, really good. Great results, great relationships, and great process. So if that's sort of the number one philosophy of collaborative leadership, let us get to you the other pieces, and then we're going to dive in a little bit. So we showed you the Norman Storm and journey, and you're familiar with that. But we'd ask you to think about maybe there's a new journey for a team to take them on. Because you've got the team, and you've got the destination, although you're not exactly sure what it is, but you've got the results. So there's sort of six pieces that we think are important in this new journey. Number one, create a diverse team. And this isn't just diversity in demographics, which is important but it's also diversity in professional experience, functional experience, technology acumen, even personalities, diversity of personalities. And then you've got to make sure to give the team the space and the tools to be successful. There's physical space, virtual collaboration tools, what's your remote and in-office policies, and how do you make collaboration easy so they can focus on the, the, the work that they're actually doing? Third, how do you bring everybody together to be clear on the values that drive the behavior of the train so that leadership is shared. It isn't just the responsibility of the project manager or the senior most person. Leadership is shared. That baton is passed between people and different people step to the front at different times. And it's creating that environment of emotional safety. And now you're all coming together, acting as one. And then you got to move, right? And we often get this from executives. I need my teams to move faster. Great. We love speed. But what we found is that actually helping the teams move smarter helping, helps them move faster. So how are you designing meetings? How do you create lasting agreements that the team will align on? How do you facilitate the team so that they move well together? So now you're moving smart and fast, you're flying. How do you keep the team aligned? How do you keep the team on the road, right? But then give them enough flexibility so they can push the boundaries, but give them enough guardrails so that they get the right work done even if the right work changes. And then finally, 
things don't always go swimmingly, as you just heard from Robert. So how can you have the ability to reflect and repair as needed? Being able to course correct in small ways frequently, and maybe even in big ways if you need it. So put together in a little bit more of a framework view, this is what we're talking about with collaborative leadership, right? These are the pieces that we just talked through in order to make this work, starting with balancing results with process and relationship, and then driving on that new journey. Now, there are a bunch of tools we could talk about, and we've used all of these and more, and there are more tools out there, so we won't profess to say we've got all the right tools, but we can't, in a, in a few business over breakfast minutes, sort of share with you everything. So what we thought we would do instead is go deeper into shared accountability, moving smart to go fast, and team alignment. Funnily enough, those actually match where you all talked about that's the hardest part of a high-performing team. And then we're going to talk about tools, the values tool the meetings tool and the priorities tool. Are there other tools within each of these? Absolutely. But we wanted to pick a few that we thought were really impactful that you could use and you could try in the days and weeks that follow. Robert, let's jump into values. Let's do it. Uh, so values, uh, one of my favorite uh, tools that, that exist within companies. Um, I think the, the, the primary message should be quite clear. Uh, great values should positively guide your team's behaviors and and mindsets every day. Um, the concept here is that a lot of times companies have values. They're on a wall somewhere. It might be next to the OSHA sign that's in your break room. And the values are talked about perhaps once a year. They're not really used, right? Obviously, a company's mission and vision shapes and can inspire the direction that companies are moving in. It could be why you signed up. But your values are in a very direct framework and a direct way that influences the way it feels to work inside your company, the way it feels to treat each other. Um, you know, a manager should be able to help someone use a value. They should be able to coach you about how to best use it to support a team, to support an initiative. And more important, you should be able to be held accountable to a value. So the more action-oriented a value is, the more tangible it can be. A couple of examples of great values that I think just sort of put this into light uh, Scott, if we go to the next slide here, uh, a couple of a couple of ones, like for example, use data to drive smarter decisions. Uh, pretty simple value. Um, what it might mean for some people immediately, they may say, well, I need quantitative data. I need to have statistically significant data to drive smarter decisions. And I'm gonna use that during presentations or I'm gonna use that during planning meetings. Well, it could also mean qualitative data, right? And so the idea that a company is using data to drive smarter decisions, you still might have to explain it to employees, still might have to coach them on it. And frankly, as you're helping them do their work, as you're helping them collaborate, you can start to see where they're bringing that data from, right? And how they're trying to use that. Another one, challenge others thinking with intent. It's one thing to be a divergent thinker. It's one thing to be a devil's advocate, um, but you also can do that with respect. And you can also do it in such a way where it's valuable. So you don't just have to challenge everyone's ideas every time you uh, get into a meeting. Uh, it doesn't have to be that. You can you can wait. You can find a purpose behind challenging intent, all in support of trying to drive better thinking. And so great values, well, well uh, action-oriented values still require good coaching. But often, I feel like we see this. Uh, I feel like we see values that are, I don't know, they sound positive. Like, for example, hey, Scott, uh, this week, are you aspiring to be great? Yes. I don't know. I don't know. It's a hard one, right? Imaginative solutions. I'm sure all solutions use imagination. I just don't know how easy it is to hold someone accountable to that. And so when it's possibly vague to use, or I can't easily coach someone, or I can't hold you accountable to them, um, they're just not as effective as they can be. And so at the end of the day, you know, Scott and I really want to make sure people can walk away from this session with methods that they can use. So let's just jump right in. Like, what's a method we could use to help a team right now uh, create uh, uh, an actionable uh, uh, value that drives behavior? So uh, imagine just pulling your team into a workshop for a couple of hours. You could ask them, because the teams are already working together, what are two values or behaviors that benefit the team today? You know, as we saw in our Mentimeter, people and teams are working pretty well right now. I'm sure there are some behaviors that are that are working incredibly well for you guys. Um, find out what those are. Have people write them down on a sticky note. Have people uh, have people um, share what their thoughts are as to why. Why are those benefiting the team? Um, then let's make it a little bit harder. Let's talk about what are some values that we aren't using today or should be using to drive greater results for the team. 
And so by being able to then have, uh, Scott, if you just push forward there, one more slide, Oop. Uh, by being able to have uh, new values that emerge, um, you can have the team now have some debate. You can have some uh, healthy conflict and tension to figure out what are the types of values we need to use on a regular basis? What are some new behaviors we might need to use and leverage in order for our team to be even more successful than today? Your team leader or someone you assign as a decider can then choose and select a couple of values, really you only need two or three. And even if you have values at the company level, uh, if they're not actionable for you, your team can create their own set of values to be able to hold each other accountable and perhaps even drive better thinking and doing. Um, just a, one last little example of how to use them. Um, your values, again, don't have to just come up one time a year or in monthly staff meetings. You could, you could bring up them at weekly meetings. You could actually ask your team, how are you using them today? How have you used them? Give examples of why and how you use them and talk about successes or challenges that you've had doing it. You could obviously talk to people in one-on-one -on -one sessions, like talk about and coach them. Hey, I'm seeing you not really use data in the work that you're doing. Let's talk about why you're having a challenge with that. Obviously, in collaboration sessions or even debriefs and retrospectives, you as a team can really figure out, are we living up to our values? Are we using them to the betterment of collaboration? Or are they maybe intangible and getting in the way? So hopefully it's a method that feels tangible and something that you guys can, can leverage immediately. Uh, we're hopeful this, this feels tangible and energizing. Um, let's go into the next one. So Scott mentioned moving smart to go fast. We'll talk about meetings for a few minutes here. So meetings, uh, I have a, a pretty controversial take. I know people hate meetings. I know they don't love them. I am of the exact opposite. I am a huge believer and lover of meetings, but I look at them maybe a little differently than you guys may. Um, I look at them as the basic building block of collaboration. It's essentially to set time to be able to do something together. And so it, it dawns on us that if people spend as much time designing and building a presentation to deliver to an executive team or to a client or anyone, you should spend as much, if not more time, designing a good meeting to set yourself up for success. Um, my perspective uh, is that uh, there are, and, and, uh, there, there's a little bit like corporate cave people. Uh, uh, the way I think of it is like we learn meetings by watching others, right? It's almost like an oral tradition. It's almost written on a wall somewhere. Not a lot of people teach you how to do a meeting. Um, you often learn by observation. And so here, we're gonna give you the structure and some tools of how to do it. So the basic building blocks is really four. The first one is, and it's, and it's actually a really critical one, what brings us here today? You're setting context. A lot of us run from meeting to meeting. It's hard to keep track of what we're here to do. And so by having just a little bit of time set aside for this, you make a big difference in framing how people should think. The second part is meeting types. And in a moment, I'll get into them. There's seven types of meetings. Um, there's only, only seven. You can build, combine, and twist them together, build whatever you want to build everything from a small meeting to a workshop. Uh, but by knowing how to use those, you can actually help your participants in the meeting as much as yourself know how to show up. You want to define success. You want to ensure what people uh, are supposed to be doing in the room and what are we trying to achieve. Again, often it's sort of ambiguous. I'm in a room. I'm here to do something, but I'm not exactly sure what. Defining success and talking about it at the, st at the, uh, at the start of a meeting is really critical. And then finally, the obvious one, uh, let's plan some topics. What should we discuss at what length and perhaps how? So when we move into that, let's talk about the next part of it, which is the seven types of meetings. So the first one is share information. Really simple. Keep everyone in the loop with updates and announcements. You have these meetings all the time. They could be a stand-up. They could be a monthly uh, announcement. But what's going on in the company? Very, very simple. Teach. You could actually have sessions where you're teaching people about a new team, a new skill, a new policy. Advanced thinking. You could brainstorm, debate, explore new possibilities together. Solve problems. You're tackling challenges head on, finding solutions. Sometimes meetings could just be about making decisions. Choices are debated, decisions are made, but we were focused on them. Asking for feedback, gathering your input, or gathering input from others on your work, it's critical. You can design a meeting for that. And finally, bonding with your team and strengthening work relationships. This is a big one. So building community is another type of meeting you can do. One of the things I think really, really interesting as a leader and a manager is often when teams are struggling, I'm gonna to talk to them about how they're running their meetings. I'm gonna to talk to them about the types of meetings they have, how they're spending their time. And what you often find is people are trying to do six or seven of these in a one hour time frame. Um, it doesn't work really well. And so this can be an interesting way to diagnose your team of how are we operating? How are we spending our time and collaborating together? Um, let me give you a few more examples here. 
Um, so for example, a marketing insights presentation, it's really about sharing information and advancing thinking. So you're obviously bringing new ideas, data, and trends, and perhaps you shift into brainstorming about how this can fuel new strategies or improve existing ones. Perhaps you want to develop a strategy session. You're sharing information. You're asking for feedback. You're making decisions. Perhaps you want to develop a team um, and do some sort of team development workshop where you build new skills or concepts. Um, and you could obviously incorporate team building activities, not just learning about uh, a skill or a method. And then finally, even a product review. Hey, listen, we're, we're trying to get feedback. We're addressing some key issues. We want to get feedback from you guys, uh, but also try to figure out ways to solve for it. And so finally, just to put this into practice, um, you know, it, this is this is how you could intentionally design a system of meetings. This is five meetings that I used to use with my leadership team. There were more, but this is a little bit of a truncated version. We would have a daily uh, 15 minute stand up. So we would try to share critical information that we needed across leadership and only share information. We weren't trying to solve anything. We would have some weekly planning that was heavily related to sales. And so we would share information about what's coming. We would advance thinking about who could work on it. We would have decision-making sessions where all we do is think about company and operational decisions two times a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, all in support of trying to make sure that we're not delaying key decisions that are actually holding the company back. In leadership and management and in teams, hey, listen, uh, you got to celebrate the small wins with the big ones. And so about 30 minutes uh, once a week, we would actually do this. We would talk about the things that we did that drove change in the company and made us feel a little bit better because, hey, leadership and management and working in teams is tough. Um, you don't always have a lot to celebrate. And so it was a, it was a practice and, and uh, it, was a, it was a mindfulness practice to really help us figure out what should we be celebrating. And then finally, uh, a monthly business review where we'd share information, advance thinking and build community. So as you guys can see, this type of structure can be a really simple and yet powerful way to bring greater clarity, greater structure. And quite frankly, it shows a lot of empathy for your coworkers. It shows that you're showing up and trying to design something for them to have a great conversation, to have a great series of collaborative ideas and meetings together, as opposed to showing up to a meeting and wondering how to do it together. Scott's gonna to take you through the last method. Uh, we'll talk about uh, team alignment. Awesome. So how you keep a team together in this crazy journey is also critically important. So what I'm gonna talk about is a tool called priorities. Now priorities are all about helping, if you sort of ignore the, the, the noun of it, or the, 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 the tool of it, priorities help keep people aligned on what's most important. And when people are clear on what's most important, they treat it that way and they deliver it that way. Said another way, priorities can help you avoid what's called collaborative drift, which we love that. And again, some drift is good, too much drift is bad. And so finding the right way to do that is key. So priorities can help on that. The problem is in most priorities, they often team tend to be implicit not explicit, they're not written down, they're not used frequently, right? Sometimes they're written down, sometimes they exist on a PowerPoint of the kickoff of the team, and then you've sort of forgotten about them. Other times priorities are what you might think of as protected by the leader, right? Which is more about, okay, I'm the leader, I'm gonna keep this in myself, I'm gonna use this to report to stakeholders, but I'm not gonna be as transparent with the team. And sometimes they're said at the beginning of the year and aren't revisited since. What I would, what we would postulate is that actually making priorities more of an ongoing living experience is what matters. So here's how you could redesign priorities for your team. Three steps. Let's walk through it. Number one, make a one pager, make it a living one pager that answers the question, who does what by when and how's it going? Really, really simple, right? And there may be four pieces. There's a description of that priority or that work stream. There's the name, whose name is attached to it. What's the date of that work stream? And then even the, what's the qualitative status as of today? Now, what we found and what you know is that nobody likes red or yellow next to their name. However, we need to, the team needs to be honest with itself about how it's going. It's not just Mike's problem that this is red. It's the team's problem, but Mike is the one who owns it. So now we've got a living dashboard that we use and update frequently. That's number one. Number two is you've got to get these priorities to the right altitude. What we're not talking about is a as a task list. These are the 10 tasks I've got to do today. That's too low of an altitude, like set up a meeting with key stakeholders, right? But also deliver the project on time and on budget is too high. What we're talking about is something that highlights the most important work over the next week or two, 
we find that that time frame is actually really helpful because it doesn't change too much, but it changes enough and it helps drive the work. Because people tend not to be able to work in sort of month long thinking and the task is too much. We don't want to micromanage this. So something like submit the research plan after a review with the team by August 2nd is much tighter. So we've got to get the priorities to the right altitude. And then third, we want to use it. This isn't just a tool we put on the side. We want to use it throughout our team activities. We want to use it when we set goals. We want to bring it into team meetings. How's this going? How do we make this yellow? How do we make this green? How's that going? The team stays together. Use it in one-on-ones when you're sitting there talking to Mike or Jill or any of those other people. Use it in all hands. Use it in stakeholder reviews. Use it in performance reviews. What we're driving at is just better clarity on what's important and how it connects to everything else to help the team stay aligned. So those are the three steps. And I would just say, remember, it's more important to use something uh, this tool constantly, consistently and constantly and evolve it than it is to get it perfect. We're not trying to get it perfect. We're trying to get it good enough. All right. So those are the three tools we wanted to share with you. And we know we went super fast through them, but hopefully you get enough of them, maybe even to try it, right? And we've also talked about this larger framework, but let's bring it back to the people, to the humans we've talked about. We know that humans do better when there are a handful of things they know. And so the three tools we talked about today, they're three things that helps humans better perform. In values, it's what matters most to the team and how to behave. With meetings, knowing why you're meeting and how you can contribute can help every one of those team members better participate. Again, that process of engagement, making it easy. And priorities, if people know what work matters most, they can focus on the right things. So at the end of day, the end of the day, collaborative leadership is about having humans helping those humans of the team create the conditions so they can perform their best. Because at the end of the day, humans do best when we trust. When we trust in our team members, when we trust in the work, when we trust in the role they play, when they trust in themselves, that's what collaborative leadership is all about. And I love this picture, so I, I felt like I really had to use it. Okay. Now it's back to your turn, turn before we get to questions. So back to Minty, here we go. If you can bring back up Minty, question three. Now that we've gone through this, how good is your team at collaboration? What do you think? These are the same question we ask. Very good, okay, somewhat, or not at all. How good is your team at collaboration? All right, we're starting to see some, some uh, elements come in. That's great. We appreciate the participation. The shape of the curve is starting to look like when we started, right? Which is great. Uh, funnily enough, it, sounds, it seems like a few people feel like they're actually a little better than they thought they were, which is great. The number of okays went down a bit and the number of somewhats really started to go up a little bit. And that's okay, right? The reality is we are collaborating already, right? We do that type of thing, but we can get better. And so what we hope we did today is to bring to the forefront some aspects of that, aspects of this. So one more Minty question, which is, which of these tools discussed do you think could help your team the most? Is it values that Robert covered to drive behavior? Is it meetings that Robert covered to help the team move smart? Is it priorities to help the team stay together? So we'll give it just a couple of seconds on that, um, and then we'll be ready to take some questions. All right, fascinating. All right, so value, so priorities, really good tool for a lot of people, that's great. Meetings, you know, I love the way Robert talked about the back to basics. It's funny, and I think Elizabeth uh, mentioned this in, uh, I think it was Elizabeth who mentioned this in the chat uh, about meetings uh, in general, right? Which is meetings can actually be good, right? But they have to be used the right way and getting back to basics is great. All right, all right, with that, let's get into questions uh, along the way. So again, use Zoom chat, use the Q&A, uh, and I think Nicola is going to come back on as well and help us navigate through this in the last in the next ten minutes. Wonderful! This has been fabulous, uh, Scott um, and Robert. Thank you so much. So we do have a question, or we have several questions actually. Um, first is, what types of technology do you suggest to help manage these collaborations? Teams, Slack, Jira, Trello, Smartsheet, etc. Oh, I love this question. Uh, so I have a confession. I hate email. I hate email so much. I hate Outlook. I hate everything about it. 
so for teams that I'm on, we actually create working agreements of the tools we want to use. So truly, it just becomes a dialogue between the team about what is what is the best. And so we've agreed, for example, we use Slack as our primary communication tool. We use email, obviously, for external communication. I can't fully get away from using email, guys. Uh, but we'll also use tools like Miro or Mural in order to document and whiteboard collaborative sessions that we take on together. Uh, we obviously have document file sharing systems where we try to uh, uh, you know, organize and collect the data that we're, we have. So as a team, we just ask the question, like, what, what do we really want to use? And, and often what we'll find is we're using too many tools and how do we reduce them? Yeah, that's what I was going to add, which is, look, I, we all have our favorite tools. Lots of tools work, but what matters is how the team wants to work. And so just like in innovation where you're trying to figure out, you know, what the right problem is and how to solve it well, what's the right tool and what's it going to do for you? I've used Basecamp, I've used Slack, I've used Teams, I've used Trello. I'm a big fan of Trello. But again, it depends on the team. These are tools that can enable the team, not the other way around. Okay. Uh, I just saw a in the chat, um, Mara asks, would you suggest things like inspirational quotes or videos to share values? My team meetings are very stale and people don't go beyond the agenda. I'm new to my company and want more idea flow. Mm, interesting I love question. that. I love yeah. that. You, Robert, yeah, you want to start it, on yeah, that? Yeah, you got it, man. It sounds like you had something immediately. Yeah, so um, I, I think a couple of thoughts come to mind. The thing that I've seen help teams, help organizations the most is to bring the customer to the table, whether that's through videos, whether that's through an empathy interview, whether that's actually inviting the customer. In fact, at Amazon, they have a rule in every meeting that there has to be an empty chair and that empty chair represents the customer, right? Because they're always trying to think about the customer. So yes, I love videos. I love multimedia. But what I care more about is the content. And what we find organizations by definition are designed to solve for customers, right? That's their purpose. So how to bring that in more? I think back to Robert's work, you know, how you sort of create to advance thinking, uh, to brainstorm. Those are all great tools. But even just some inspiration from customers, either we solve them well or solve don't solve them well, can be a really sort of trigger or stoke, if you will, within a meeting. Wonderful. Thank you. Is this, this might be sort of, it feels a little uncomfortable to ask this question, but how do I know if I'm bad at collaboration? <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I have, I have lots of thoughts. Uh, Go Scott, for it, Robert. Here, I'll do a couple. You do it. I, I mean, I, it is an uncomfortable question. Um, I think the easiest thing to do is to go to someone you truly trust, someone who you work with that can give you true feedback. And, and asking for feedback has to be a gift, right? It has to be something where you where you yourself can be open enough and share that you're open and willing to accept that and listen. I think collecting feedback is probably the number one piece of the puzzle to hear and see that. Um, I think once you have that, I think you could at least have a little bit of a baseline to go off of to try to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would just one tool you could use uh, that we use in innovation is called I like and I wish. Right. Which is you could say, hey, uh, to this person you trust, hey, can you tell me one thing I'm really good at in collaborating and one opportunity that I have? And you can use I like I wish and that person can say I like this. I wish that that can be a really good way for them to get more comfortable. And then for you, you need to just listen. Listen to understand, not respond. Just say thank you. As Robert said, feedback is a gift. Uh, and the other thing I would say is. None of us are perfect at collaboration. So don't think of I'm terrible at this and I'll never be good. We all have work to do. So I think us, uh, our ability, and Elizabeth said something really good in the chat, which is our ability to learn and do and learn and do is a really important way to get better at collaboration because we all need to. One, one last little tip I would just throw out there is that um, if you're not comfortable having that conversation, you could even ask someone, hey, listen, I'm, I'm, I admit it. Hey, I feel really uncomfortable asking you about this. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you could take some time to reflect. You could just write it, email me back or whatever, as opposed to having it be what feels like a confrontation. Obviously, it can be scary to give feedback. And so mm -hmm. giving them the opportunity to reflect on it, to take some time and write you could also just be another method that feels a little bit easier for the person you're asking and maybe for yourself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we've got a couple more uh, questions here. John asks, how do you deal with a team member that has an innate personality to always wanting to be on top? Very self-oriented, not thinking about the team. They try to make their contribution sound like it's for the team, but it's really for the self, for themselves. How do you deal with this? I'll, I'll just leave up and just say, I, I think this is a great example of where leveraging your values is an amazing tool to coach this person. 
And so if you have company values that you feel like could help, let's just say offset or create a mirror for them to reflect on and say, you know, again, if, if you're in a managerial role and this is someone you manage, it becomes a little bit easier. If it's a peer, it's a little bit harder. Um, and so I think I think the, the challenge will be trying to figure out and create dialogue between you and this person to see, are there things about company values? Are there things about team norms that you could talk with them about um, that help them see and reflect? Hey, we're, we're not quite on track. Like we're a little bit off track and what that could look like. Another way to frame it, depending upon, you know, the type of person this is, um, it could be about just having a conversation about others and saying, hey, listen, like we really want to give other members of the team opportunities to think, opportunities to shine. Um, I, I need you to find a way to allow others to speak and share ideas and share the spotlight. Um, I want to hear from you how you could think about doing that. Um, as opposed to having to solve it for them, let them try to solve it for you. Um, it makes a big difference. It's a little bit of facilitative leadership in that point, of, in that type of dialogue, um, as opposed to directive leadership, which frankly will probably bounce right off that person. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of the values to sort of help align and what matters, and hopefully that can that can that can help. I think the other thing to think about is to try to figure out what motivates this person. Different people get motivated by different things and can be influenced different ways. Some people can be influenced by peer pressure, right? And so if you can, if they, if that's the type of person, then the team sort of getting aligned on values and really pushing the team over me concept can help. Other people, you know, deal with what I would call sort of close counsel. So take them to the side and say, hey, let's talk about this. How's it? How do you think it's going? And have a one-on-one -on -one instead of it being the peer pressure things. And so there's a lot of great books and tools in, in power and influence. Uh, but I think it just goes back to, you know, other than if you can't change the team or create the right team from the beginning, you're just going to have to figure it out. Because I will tell you what I've seen most teams do is let situations like that fester and it ends up killing the relationships, killing the process, and it usually impacts the results. And so being able to deal with it is the sign of a good team or good team members to make that work. Uh, and deal with it earlier because it's only going to get worse. And I think we all know that, but that's a challenge. Easy to say, hard to do. So I think we've got time for, for, for one last question. And there are a couple in the chat that are very similar around being in a sales organization and where often the top performers are rewarded. Mm -hmm. That can be a turnoff for the, the, the people that are, that are not in that top um in that top group so how do you help bridge that gap between um that sort of uh, open open discussion about who's making a huge impact and and helping bring along those people that that perhaps aren't performing at that level at that moment yeah, I think about a couple of things. Um, one, I would say, you know, having worked a lot with sales organizations over the years, there are other metrics than just bottom line numbers, right? Now, those are the ones that are important. I get it. You got to sign contracts. Um, but I think it's as a team, there should be metrics. There should be known metrics about the activities, the behaviors that you're doing in order to actually achieve what will eventually become a sale. Um, I think the more you guys as a team talk about that process, talk about what's been working, talk about the successes that you've had, the better. I would also say there's another easy one to use that sort of removes the metric side of it, but it actually gets to the learning, which Scott actually talked about it a moment ago, but in a slightly different way. Celebrate the customer, right? Every one of you are on the front lines talking to customers every day. The insights that you bring back could be incredibly valuable, not just to the top performers, but for everybody else. And that also includes other people in the organization. And so sales acts as a pseudo way of doing actual customer discovery. And therefore you could be impacting the marketing team, the product teams, et cetera, all because you're having frontline conversations with customers. And so I think it's figuring out what are the other types of activities, what are the other types of behaviors that also should be celebrated because it takes all of that to eventually get to these sales. As a sales leader, you have to find that balance and it totally makes sense the question, but I think you have to figure out ways of celebrating the journey getting there, not just the end result. Mm -hmm. I think that was said. Yeah, I do too. I think that was said well. I think two things, quick things I'd add is, you know, not everybody is perfect on results, right? If I go back to the triangle, results, those are sales. That's great. But other people have strengths in relationships and process. And what we find is the best teams bring all of them together. And so maybe there's a, a quote salesperson who's better at the relationship building. How can they learn from the person who's better at results and vice versa? And so how do you put the pieces together so that the team is stronger than the individuals? I will say uh, sales is a unique sort of organization without a doubt. I worked with um, Ashley and Justin who wrote this book called Naked Sales 
uh, which is all around using design thinking, which is a, a customer driven approach to innovation, uh, to innovate sales. There might be some other things in there that would be helpful as well. Wonderful. Okay. Thank so, you so much. You've got some last thoughts. I do. So okay. I want to leave you all with a last thought, which is, which is this. You're already good. So don't worry if you're terrible at collaboration. You're not. You're good. Everybody's good, right? And don't think this is about throwing out everything you know about how to collaborate. Everybody collaborates differently, right? And oh, by the way, we're already supposed to be good at it. And many of us are, many of all of us are to some degree. How do we get good at this? But the reality is the world is changing, right? It keeps going faster. The problems we faced are more wicked than they've ever been. And so what Robert and I are seeing is this need to get even better. We need to be great at collaboration. And yet funnily enough, right? We don't practice it, but we need to practice it. We've got to practice collaboration to make this thing work. You may be familiar with this. This is the US Women's National Team who just won the Olympic gold. And what I would tell you is even the best teams in the world practice being a great team. So this is Emma Hayes in the red shirt and she's coaching. And of course she's coaching soccer, right? Which is great. But did you also know she brought in a karaoke machine and there's some amazing karaoke singers on the team? Did you know she also brought in puzzles and she has puzzles in the locker room and Legos in the locker room? Because she believes that building chemistry and building those relationships is as important as the soccer. They did pretty well. Hopefully they'll do even better going forward uh, as they go, which is awesome. So even the best teams have to practice at being best teams. And we should practice too, because the good news is the best teams and team members are made. They're not born. So keep making yourself a collaborator. Hopefully we've given you an ability to see some of these things and try some of these things. Let us know how it go, goes and great luck to you. And with that, uh, Heather, I think you're going to come back on uh, and wrap us up. Hey everyone, thank you so much. Scott and Robert, this was amazing. Your energy is uh, contagious and the information of course is fantastic. So thank you so much for sharing all this. I love the uh, the point you made about having an empty chair at the meeting representing the customer. I think that's fantastic, love that. Um, thank you Nicola for sharing or for leading us today. We really appreciate that as always, um, both of you. Just so good to have you here, I'm so glad. Uh, so my name is Heather Dufoe. I'm part of the open enrollment team here at the Goizueta Business School, and I certainly appreciate, as we all do, you sharing your morning with us today. Um, I have the opportunity to just share a few things coming up as we move into the ninth month of this year. Where has the time gone? I can't believe it. Uh, so September 5th coming up, we're going to talk about how organizations can support employee well-being. That's on September 5th. And on September 19th, we're going to talk about a clarion call for calling culture into the C-suite. That's a tongue twister. Uh, we hope that you will join us for one of those two or both of those business over breakfast. And then I uh, want to take just a second to highlight a few upcoming things on our fall open enrollment schedule. Uh, first, we have the Goizueta Executive Women's Leadership Program. This is an immersive two-month hybrid program that's going to be running in September and October, really about uh, focused on elevating your women and uh, women leaders and inspiring them to their full potential. And then also in October, we have two uh, short courses coming up, uh, both in October, Executive Communication and Leadership Presence and Negotiation Strategy for Success. And then I'm super excited to talk about uh, our very... Um, sought after executive coaching diploma program. We are going to, because it is doing so well and because we continue to have uh, more and more interest, we're gonna bring back an in-person cohort. That's gonna start in October and it will run every month on Thursday, once a month on Thursdays and Fridays. And that will run from October through April into 2025. Uh, so we have applications open for all of these programs through August. You can use the QR code on your screen uh, to learn more about that. And we should also have more information in the chat. Um, yeah, so please um, don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions about this or open enrollment programs. And we certainly hope that we will see you on another Business Over Breakfast soon. Thank you all for joining and hope you have a great day. Thanks all.